Grace, Heavenly Father, we do give you thanks for this day. Lord, we, we in Florida especially thank you for the, uh, the continued breath of cool weather that we've enjoyed here and for John and I, even as we rode all the way down south to the Keys. And so, Lord, we thank you for uh, successful trips and for bonding uh, times together. And uh, just thank you for uh, the, the bonding time that we have uh, through these Bible studies and by drawing us closer to you and helping us understand more about your holy word and how much you really love us. So Lord, we thank you and pray that you would just be with us tonight. And I pray that you would send your Holy Spirit upon us so that we would see not only with our eyes, but our hearts as well, and that we would be continued, transformed more into your likeness. In Christ's name we pray. And everybody in the Lord said, Amen. Amen. All right. So um, some of you know, and you may have been waiting for the email, says we're doing 10 and 11. But I looked at 10 a few weeks ago and decided 10 had enough in it all by itself. So we're just doing uh, chapter 10 tonight. So if you have your Bibles, go ahead and turn. Um, in my Bible, it's page 1719. I don't know if that helps you in finding it in yours, uh, but we are in the book of Hebrews and we are gonna be reading uh, from chapter 10. And uh, Chris, I'm gonna invite you to, uh, my Chris, sorry. Uh, so we're going to invite you to read uh, chapter 10, verses 1 through 18. The law is only a shadow of the good things that are coming, not the realities themselves. For this reason, it can never, by the same sacrifices repeated endlessly year after year, make perfect those who draw near to worship. Otherwise, would they not have stopped being offered? <clears throat> for the worshipers would have been cleansed once for all and would no longer have felt guilty for their sins. But those sacrifices are an annual reminder of sins. It is impossible for the blood of bulls and goats to take away sins. Therefore, when Christ came into the world, he said, Sacrifice and offering you did not desire, but a body you prepared for me. With burnt offerings and sin offerings, you were not pleased. Then I said, here I am. It is written about me in the scroll. I have come to do your will, my God. First he said, sacrifices and offerings, burnt offerings and sin offerings you did not desire, nor were you pleased with them, though they were offered in accordance with the law. Then he said, here I am. I have come to do your will. He set aside the first to establish the second, and by that will we have been made holy through the sacrifice of the body of Jesus Christ once for all. Day after day, every priest stands and performs his religious duties. Again and again, he offers the same sacrifices, which can never take away sins. But when this priest had offered for all time one sacrifice for sins, he sat down at the right hand of God, and since that time, he waits for his enemies to be made his footstool. For by one sacrifice, he has made perfect forever those who are being made holy. The Holy Spirit also testifies to us about this. First, he says, this is the covenant I will make with them after that time, says the Lord. I will put my laws in their hearts, and I will write them on their minds. Then he adds, their sins and lawless acts I will remember no more. And where these have been forgiven, sacrifice for sin is no longer necessary. All right. Uh, so a lot of good stuff in here. So we'll take a look at our outline and uh, with number one there, the theme of the book. So just reminding you, context, context, context. And that's why we read so much scripture all at one time is that so that we have the continuity of the context of the reading. But remember, it's not in isolation. And so as we've been going through this, we've seen that the author's main point is contrasting and comparing uh, Jesus with the old way and saying the old was good, but the old is gone and the new is here. Out with the old, in with the new. And so he's been focusing on the theme, uh, which is the superiority of Christ. 
So remember, for thousands of years, uh, these Hebrew people uh, were God worshipers, God fearers. Uh, they knew the Old Testament inside and out, and uh, they knew how to worship God. But they also knew that the only way for them to be righteous and clean and holy was to have these at least annual, if not regular, sacrifices for their sins. And so now he's kind of showing them, saying that was good, but how imperfect it was. So uh, the second uh, sentence there, the author continues to make this case that while the law is good, it is imperfect. It is only a shadow of a better way to come. In the same way, sacrifices are imperfect and must be done on a regular basis. In verse four, he closes the door on any hope of these things to make us righteous before God. Let me just pause for just a moment here because I think it's really important for us to understand what these original hearers would have heard and what they were going through. So you already know that they were all in line with God and the scripture and Moses and Noah and all these things, uh, King David, they were all in line with that. But now uh, with Jesus, there's something new that's come. And so there's, there's a little bit of uncertainty with that. They, they're believers in Jesus. And yet as the persecutions, we have to remember that many of these people would have been cut off for their families. Does anybody remember on the day of Pentecost, how many people joined the church? Over 3,000, okay? The question is how many people actually heard the message? We happen to know there was well over a million people in Jerusalem on the day of Pentecost. And, and so 3,000, to us sounds pretty good. That sounds like a lot of people. But you have to remember how many people heard the message and did not believe. They did not turn. And so while we get excited about it, say 3,000 in one day, woohoo, man, you know, wouldn't that be great? Uh, but then you have to realize when many of these people tried to go home, when they tried to go back to their jobs, um, uh, the, the Jewish term for that is that their families would have sat Shiva on them, which means you turn your back on them. So these people would have lost homes, they would have lost jobs, and many of them were being hunted and persecuted for belonging to this new religion, this upstart religion called the way. And so we have to remember that and, and have some compassion to say they were in this track for a long time with the Old Testament and the old system and the sacrificial laws and the cleansing and going to the temple, doing all these things. They've been doing them for generations. Well, suddenly there's a new way and they don't have to do that anymore. But as the persecutions are mounting against them, they're kind of like, I don't know. Many of you might have heard the term, you know, uh, returning to Egypt. Because after the Exodus, when the Lord brought them out, you know, with, with the 10 plagues, there's so many people who say, well, if I saw a miracle, well, obviously I would believe, duh. And it took 10 plagues or 10 miracles for Pharaoh to finally say, fine, you can go. But as soon as they left, he starts charging after him. The Lord parts the sea and they walk through. And as soon as they get to the other side, the sea collapses and kills Pharaoh's army. But about 10 minutes later, they said, we're hungry. <laughs> what do you have to eat? And so wandering in the desert was not exciting for them. Sleeping in tents was not exciting for them. At least in Egypt, they had food. At least in Egypt, they had a roof of their head, at least in Egypt. And so many of them grumbled and complained even after seeing all of those miracles and said, why, why did you bring us out here in the desert to die? I'd rather be in Egypt. And so many people, have turned their back on the Lord. 
because he didn't do what they thought he they wanted him to do. He didn't act. He didn't respond in that way. But you can imagine the pressure that's put on these baby Christians, if you will, to, to go back. And then um, does anybody remember the fancy word that we've used a couple of times for the blending of religions? Starts with an S. Syncretism. Syncretism. That's right. S-Y-N-C-R-E-T-I-S-M. That's not in your notes. That's just a bonus. Um, but you can imagine, well, what if we continue to profess our faith in Jesus because we think it's real, we think he rose from the dead, but just to cover our bases, why don't we go ahead and offer the sacrifices as well? And so that's what they're doing is they're shrinking back. The pressure is mounting against them. And I, for one, can see how easily it might have been for them to want to go back to the old way. And right in the middle of that, this is when the author writes this book of Hebrews. And he's like, stop, do not take another step, do not shrink back, do not, you can have one or the other, you can't play a little bit uh, uh, of each one. And, and so he's, he's reminding them of the supremacy of Christ and that he's shutting the door on the old system saying, that old system, that can't save you. It never could save you. In fact, that's why they had to keep doing it over and over and over again. The sacrifices are imperfect. The priests are imperfect. Um, one of the problems they had with the priest kept dying, right? You know, and he's like, hey, now we have a better priest, one who is eternal, one who has risen from the dead, one who has made the perfect once and for all sacrifice. So I kind of wanted you to get the flavor and the idea of what it might have been like uh, for them. So in the middle of the paragraph in verse four, he closes the door on any hope of these things, the old things, to make us righteous before God. It is impossible for the blood of bulls and goats to take away sin. So impossible does not leave wiggle room. It doesn't say, you know, it was good for a time. And you know what? Let's just keep doing a little bit of that too, just to make sure. Uh, let's cover the basis. He says, no, it is impossible for the blood of bulls and goats to take away sins. And with the failure of any hope in these begs the question, what can make us righteous? What can make us holy? And he answers in verse five, Christ. Christ is the only hope we have of being made holy before God. While laws are good and sacrifices are good, they are insufficient. And only faith in the sacrifice of Christ. Sacrifice is your first fill in the blank there. S-A-C-R-I-F-I-C-E. Sacrifice of Christ can make us righteous before God. Now, I wanted you to fill in the blank with sacrifice. That's kind of your key word for uh, this number one here because there are too many people today that I think treat the passion of Christ too lightly. Um, they are Christian light and just want a little bit and um, don't have to go to church, don't wanna to go to Bible study, don't wanna to have to work, don't wanna to have to do anything. But yeah, if he's offering a free gift of life, then I'll take it. Um, and, and I think we have to understand. Um, I've gotten many comments about our Good Friday service. Um, probably one of my favorite was, uh, I got a note from somebody, I don't think she's here tonight, um, that, that said, you made me cry on Friday and on Easter Sunday, I'm going home with joyous tears. Um, but I think that's what we have to feel. We have to remember, and we cannot uh, treat lightly the sacrifice and the torture of Christ. If you have not seen the passion of Christ, I challenge you, I encourage you to do it. Um, when it first came out, Chris and I were uh, serving a church and we got some of our good Bible study friends that said, hey, let's, let's go out, let's watch the movie, then let's go dinner, and we'll talk about it. And uh, we got to dinner, nobody ordered. <laughs> um, we were kind of all sick to our stomachs. And, but the reality of what he went through um, for us. And so we should never, ever, ever treat cheaply 
or lightly the sacrifice of Christ, and we must understand there was no other way. It was prophesied that he, the Christ, would be a suffering Messiah. Isn't it funny how you read things and you just pick out the things you like and then the rest of it you discard? Well, somewhere along the way, they had discarded the idea that the, 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 the Messiah would be a suffering Messiah. And Jesus is like, you guys don't even know your own Bible. Don't you know? I came to serve, not to be served. And I came to be the suffering servant for you. So I just continue to challenge us in our day and age to take very seriously the cross of Christ, to take very seriously. And, and because we have to understand, um, if we as a parent would do anything, including die for our children out of that love, then how much more does a holy God care and love us and how much must Jesus have loved us to ask, is there any other way? There's no other way. So nevertheless, not my will, but your will be done. And so we want to understand it from the original hearers, but even today, what does it still mean for us today? And so we must remember that sacrifice. And number two, in verses five through seven, the author substantiates his claim by quoting Jesus, who offers himself as the fulfillment of scripture. Sacrifice and offering you did not desire, but a body you prepared for me. With burnt offerings and sin of offerings, you were not pleased. And then I said, here I am. It is written about me in the scroll. I have come to do your will. And explains in verses 8 through 10 that the first, the law and sacrifices, had to be set aside. So remember, he's not saying option A and B. He's, he's continuing to say there is no other option. There is no other fail safe. There is no going back. He said they had to be set aside and that by the will of God, Jesus offered himself as a once and for all sacrifice. And by that sacrifice, we have been made holy. H-O-L-Y is your fill in the blank there. And that's something that we need to understand. Um, in Revelation, it tells us that in the end times, when everyone's being separated, um, if you'd like a big fancy seminary word, it's in the eschaton, E-S-C-H-A-T-O-N. And the eschaton, that is the final triumph of good over evil, when he separates everything. He says, <laughs> there are, the gates are not shut, but nothing impure will ever enter into heaven. How many of us are pure? <laughs> on our own <laughs> not one and so this word holy um, it comes from the Greek hagios um, and it means to be different when God is holy he is different from anyone else he is higher than any other supposed God he is higher than humanity he is, he is completely set apart he's the one and only all right it means different it means set apart it means cleansed and it means consecrated so for us and I was trying to think of a good metaphor for this and maybe you all have heard some along the, the way but it's not that we ourselves are pure. It's that through the blood of Christ, we are cleansed. <laughs> Our soiled robes or rags are cleansed. And only, if you will, God sees us through Jesus' goggles. He does not see our sin 
and, and I try not to stress that too much because he is omniscient, so he knows everything. And yet, through the blood sacrifice of Christ, we are cleansed, and we are made pure, and we are made holy. Not that we did it on ourselves. We didn't. All have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. All of us are separated from God. That's why I keep saying the fail-safe is not heaven. The fail-safe is hell. And the only way to change that trajectory is through Christ. Only through Christ can we be cleansed, washed clean, forgiven, and be made pure to be made holy so that we can live with him uh, forevermore. Before faith in, um, uh, in Christ, second to last line in number two, before faith in Christ, we are unholy. It is through our faith in Christ's sacrifice alone that can cleanse us of our sin, set us apart from the world, and make us acceptable to a holy God. Everybody get it? Any, any questions or better ways of explaining it or anything? Everybody? Okay. All right. Well, good. I, I think it's really important for us to understand the necessity of the suffering and the sacrifice of Christ and that it is our only chance. And so <laughs> I know I kind of feel like I'm, you know, beating a dead horse, preaching to the choir, whatever you want to say. But because I just see so many people who claim Christianity that don't belong to a church, they don't go to worship, they don't like Bible studies, they don't, you know, like, but, well, he offered me his life, so I accept it. So therefore, um, <laughs> they treat it like, like if you remember playing Monopoly as kids and you got the get out of hell free card. Uh, that's kind of what it is. They, they feel like, I call it a Jesus inoculation. That some people got just enough Jesus when they were kids that they know the answers. And so I don't have to go to church anymore. I don't have to do anything with that. I don't like those people. They're boring, whatever. By the way, I was just on our website and looking for it uh, for something for, um, um, anyway, I'd never paid attention to the reviews of our church. Um, I was pleased to see we got 4.7 out of five stars for everybody that's given reviews. But I felt like it was a genuine review because there was one person that gave us one star. I guess because there was no stars weren't an option between one and five. Um, <laughs> But I also feel like there's just some people who aren't going to get it. Like if you look at restaurant reviews, there's some people who aren't going to like it no matter how good it is. And, and so I almost give credulity to the websites who continue to put stuff out there. And, they, and by the way, it wasn't about me, it was you. It was like these people were mean and condescending. I'm like, whoa. <laughs> you know, um, just wanted to make sure it was clear that you know, it wasn't my fault. Um, but it also makes me feel like uh, there's a great story about a pastor when somebody comes in from, you know, some other state and says, you know, we, well, we, we had a, you know, we, we're coming in and we're new. Can you tell us about your church? Can you tell us about the people here? And he said, well, let me ask you a question. Um, he says, how were the people at your old church? Oh, they were wicked, they were mean, and they were nasty people. He said, oh, I hate to tell you, but you're probably going to find that here too. <laughs> but if they come in and they say, it was the sweetest, most kindest, lovingest church you'd ever want to be a part of, he says, congratulations, I think you'll find exactly the same thing here too. You know, you, you kind, of, kind of bring it with you as to how you respond, but most of our our reviews are, are, are positive. I just thought it, that surprised me, so I, I'd share it with you. So, so be nicer to people when they come in, okay? All right. Um, number three. Verse 14 adds some controversy. Uh, wouldn't be a fun Bible study if we didn't have some kind of controversy. Um, to the eternal security debate. Um, the eternal security debate is there are some people who hold fast to once you are saved, there's nothing anybody can do, not even you can do. The promises of God are, 
you know, uh, irrevocable. And so once you're saved, you're always going to be saved. Um, there are certain people who believe that God's already decided beforehand who's going to be saved, who's not going to be saved, and you can't change your stripes either way. Okay. But there are many scriptures that I personally feel like, and I feel like the book of Hebrews itself is challenging this notion of eternal security. Um, I agree with some of the opponents that say, like in this particular passage, I don't think that's exactly what it's talking about. And so I kind of wanted to set that idea up and I didn't get to really finish this well a couple of weeks ago. Um, the idea that people could think differently, but what we agree on is Jesus. And as long as we're facing Jesus, then we don't have to worry about the back end of things. We don't have to worry about slip sliding away or backsliding or whatever. Um, and so I just want to give you a little bit that this kind of has some controversy to it. Um, for, uh, in verse 14, uh, to the end of the line there, first line, for by one sacrifice he has made perfect forever those who are being made holy. Okay, well, boy, I spent a lot of time on this one um, because I think you can read into a lot of it um, as in forever does not seem to leave a lot of options. It just says, ah, you're being made holy forever. Um, well, let me, let me read this because I think maybe I, I explain it maybe a little bit better in here. Um, so um, let me read that line again. For by one, by one sacrifice, he has made perfect forever those who are being made holy. And that's emphasis of his mind there. So first, this has to do with the subject, which is Christ. And so um, what is perfect forever is his sacrifice. And that's what he's saying is that you can trust in this you can put your life on it. You can take the money, put it in the bank on the understanding that Christ is the once and for all perfect sacrifice. And so we don't have to keep repeating it. We don't have to keep doing it over again. It's the perfect sacrifice. It is sufficient once and for all. And the second qualifier seems to be ongoing sanctification of those being made holy. Now, some of you and I could read into this. So the sacrifice is perfect and we are being made holy. There's a saying in, in Christian circles, you know, I have been saved. I'm being saved. I will be saved. And so if you are a card carrying member, genuine, serious, disciple of Jesus Christ, you're in the right line. But don't get out of line. Um, boy, that's a, uh, that's actually could be pretty good. Um, but if you're like me, when you're choosing the grocery store lines, isn't invariably the ones that have the fewer number of people go the longest? So you get in that line and then somebody, you know, well, how much was this and how much was that? And I had tomatoes were half off and there's like some kind of discussion. And the line that had 20 people is flying through. And you finally get disgusted and get in that line. And what happens then? Somebody's got a question and the line you were in just zips right on through. Don't change lines. That's the, the moral of the story. Hang in there and focus on Christ and you keep your nose to the grindstone and you keep leaning in to Christ has already done the work and we are the ones who are being made holy. In Wesleyan circles, we talked about prevenient grace, pre-event, before I even knew Christ knew me or cared about me or loved me, he was already working in my life justifying grace is that 
Kairos moment, the aha moment, when you finally went, ding, I get it. I understand. I believe. Not only do I believe that Jesus was a real person who lived thousands of years ago, I believe he rose from the dead. And not only that, I truly believe that he died on the cross for my sins so that I could be considered holy. That's like, ah. Oh. And sadly, I think some people just stop there. They go, woohoo, got my get out of hell free card. I believe in Jesus. You know, here's my card. Well, to that I say, read Matthew 7. <laughs> and if you don't know what it says by now, it's one of my go-tos. Not everybody who calls out to me, Lord, Lord, is going to be saved. And you go, oh, ooh, well, what do we do? Well, you need to continue the process because we are saved at that point of justification. And probably poorly, but you know, with justification, um, sometimes we in the Christian circle say, it's just as if I'd never sinned. It's being made holy in that moment, but we're not done yet. A baby is a perfect human being at that right time, at that right age, and yet it's not done growing yet. And so as Christians, um, and, and you say, when can I stop growing? I'm like, when you see Jesus, when you see his face to face, you can stop then because you're already there. But until we get there, man, there's more to know, more to study, more to learn, and, and more to grow. And so that's what we call the sanctification or the sanctifying grace that continues moving us along. Anybody have any idea what we're moving toward? Perfection. That's called glorifying grace. And that perfection, and Wesley believed that it could happen for people in this life. But for most of us, it doesn't happen until we're with Jesus. And that means we become perfect in love. We don't have perfect knowledge, so we're still going to make some mistakes along the way. But we can live so much out of the love of Christ that we live for other people. We put their needs ahead of our needs, that we do everything for them out of a heart of love. And um, if we're honest, most of us are not there yet, still working on it. But the idea is we have to keep, keep coming and we have to keep putting ourselves in the places to grow. We have to keep coming to worship. We have to keep coming to Bible studies. We need to keep letting his word wash over us. Um, one of my favorite places to be is North Carolina with my feet in the creek and walking on those smooth stones. But you know, those stones weren't always smooth. It took thousands and thousands of years with that water washing over them to make them softer, to, to work off the rough edges. And that's what's happening with us in the sanctification process. God continues to wash us by his word and we continue. Some of us still have some spiny edges that are still out there and we need to keep going. And um, so that's the sanctification you know, process. All right. Um, so, mm, all right. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to start with the main point in number three, which is the third line, fourth line down. The main point is the sufficiency of the trustworthiness of Jesus. That's the main point. I think we need to be careful about making much ado about anything else. Don't lose the focus. Remember, the author is trying to make the case. You could, this almost seems like it's a trial, right? And he's building a case to show the people that Jesus is the Christ and that his sacrifice is perfect and that it's trustworthy. So Jesus is trustworthy and that all those who put their faith and trust in him can have full confidence before God. All right, number four. In verses 15 through 18, we see the work of the Holy Spirit. There's a two-worder, two uh, Holy Spirit. 
um, we see the work of the Holy Spirit testifying through Scripture that forgiveness is offered and no other sacrifice is necessary. We can take comfort in the consistency of Scripture for our salvation. Remember, we've talked about the Bible being canonized. It's closed. Does God still inspire? Absolutely. Well, why aren't we continuing to add books? Maybe something cool got added to it. It's like, nope. Like Prego, it's in there. It's already canonized. It's already closed because it already contains everything we need to know for our salvation and for our sanctification. So that's why we don't continue to add. Um, just so you'll have a little bit of a, a greater understanding. Weren't a lot of people writing back then? Absolutely. We've already talked about the Apocrypha, that uh, the Roman Catholic Bibles have, anybody know, is it seven more books? Uh, the Apocrypha, is that five? Okay, somewhere between five and seven uh, extra books that were not considered uh, to be at the same level uh, as what we have in the Protestant Bible. And the reason is because there was either some inconsistencies in the teachings or questions about authorship or time. They were all written after 100 AD. Everything that we have was written, we believe, prior to 100 AD. So the question is, is it going to be more accurate the farther you get away or closer? So they looked at the author. They looked at who were eyewitnesses. They looked at verification as far as what is the truth being taught in these different letters. And, um, and then they looked at the timeliness and said, those that happened closer to would be more accurate. And so it's getting harder and harder for us to be closer to uh, the resurrection of Christ, which everything is based and founded upon. So I just want to kind of give you that idea why it's closed, even though the Holy Spirit is still working, the Holy Spirit is still inspiring, but we also don't want to keep adding to it because it already ha it's complete. It has everything in it that we need to know for our own salvation. All right, uh, so we can take consistent, uh, we can take comfort, second line, number four, we take comfort in the consistency of scripture for our salvation. Some of us uh, continue to struggle with past sin. We should not. Don't raise your hands. But, but sometimes they're like, boy, you must not have the same memory I do because I have things that I regret, you know. Um, and, and yet, many of us who have been concerned about that, how could Jesus love me when I did this, when I did that? Oh, I wish. Just so you know, everybody's got regrets or they have dementia. <laughs> and they're not remembering everything correctly. Um, but God does. He's recording everything. Do you? Does that frighten anybody else? has a full-time recorder going on, every thought, not, not only every deed, every thought. So that's why Jesus said, hey, if you even thunk it, you did it. Like, what? Like, yeah, I know you were thinking it. Like, seriously, that's not even fair. Um, but anyway, so there are some of us who come to the altar on a repeated basis saying, boy, I, I sure have some regrets. I wish I could go back. And then um, once we've offered it to God, and some of you need to hear this, once we've offered it to God, he counts it no more. Yes, it was a black mark in our record, but it's been washed clean. Um, <laughs> almost like if you did something really bad when you were a minor. <laughs> Suddenly when you turn 18, they close those books, you can't read it anymore. You can't get, theoretically anyway. Well, in God's house, he closes that door on that sin. And so don't beat yourself up for something that happened a long time ago. Because once we've offered it to God, he counts it no more. It is Satan that keeps reminding us of our past, as if not even God could forgive a sinner like us. 
and then I use one of my favorite quotes from Steve Brown, that smells like smoke and comes straight from the pit of hell. There's a lot of us who've been to the altar in tears, pouring out our heart before God. I'm so sorry, and I wish I could go back. I wish I could take it back. Well, God, God knows before you even went to the altar. He knows what you're thinking. He knows what you're feeling. The problem is we leave it at the altar, but then in the last nanosecond, we pick it back up and we went on the way out the door. And then we have to come back to the altar and we have to keep leaving it there. If that's you, that's natural, that's normal. But maybe the good news is tonight, you don't have to worry about your past catching up with you. God doesn't count it against us anymore. God is loving, he's merciful, forgiving, and has made a way for all of us to be made holy through our faith and trust in Christ. We'd all do well to stop minimizing. Some people minimize sin. And I think I've shared with you, I had friends who were Roman Catholics that said, whew, I'm gonna to have to go to confession twice for what I'm about to do on Saturday night. <laughs> I'm like, I don't, I don't. I didn't know if it worked that way, but it didn't feel right back then. And I, I think I've since learned that asking forgiveness in advance and then going ahead and doing it, I don't, I don't think you get grace for that one. Um, so some people minimize sin. Many Christians live with ongoing sin because they're minimizing sin. We need to stop minimizing it and then other people, they dwell on it. So we'd all do well to stop minimizing or dwelling on the severity of our sin. All sin is bad. All are equal. All separate us from God. I, I think it's just maybe the way that we were raised here in America. We were graded from the time we were toddlers. And, and so we, we compare ourselves to each other and how did you do? Well, I got a B plus, well, I got an A plus. And I'm like, ooh, aren't you special? You know, we're just constantly being graded and we're all feeling like, well, I'm not smart like that one. I didn't do this, you know. Um, and, and so when it comes to this idea of sin, we need to understand that we're all in the same boat. <laughs> we're on the slow boat to hell but he's offering us a way out and that with that comes grace and healing and love and forgiveness. And so yet all, all sins are forgivable except one. Anybody remember? Blaspheming the Holy Spirit. Because if you don't have the Holy Spirit working for you, if you have squelched them too many times, if you have blamed him for things that he didn't do and failed to give credit for things that he is doing, and, and that, it seems like it's a tricky line, it's really not that tricky, because usually when I explain that that's the only one, that Jesus, and this is a teaching from Jesus, people, this is not me, he said, all other sins committed against me, whew, those can be forgiven. But those who blaspheme the Holy Spirit, those cannot be forgiven. Why? Because it is the Holy Spirit who gives us the convicting and the convincing. That convicting that our sin was wrong. Because, remember Jiminy Cricket? And always let your conscience be your guide. You know? And some people's conscience allows them to do things that my conscience would never allow me to do. And my conscience probably allowed me to do some things that people holier than me would never do. Your conscience cannot be your guide. The Holy Spirit is your guide. And so when we blaspheme, when we turn against the Holy Spirit, then we have no, no weapons left, if you will, to come back to grace. And that's, you know, for most of you, you know, I'm on that side. I, I, and I think this is what Hebrews actually teaches in uh, chapter one, three, four, six, ten. 10. I think there's a consistent teaching here 
And what, what he continually says is you cannot go back to the old way. You cannot keep crucifying Christ all over again. And that if you go so far, including blaspheming the Holy Spirit, it is impossible to come back. So this is written to Christians and it's giving them a warning saying, don't falter, don't slip, don't go back. There's only one way, and that's to put your faith and trust in Jesus Christ. So that's the only one. But no matter who you are, no matter what you've done, you need to know that A, God was not surprised. B, he knew you were going to do it before you knew you were going to do it. And then C, he provided a way for you to be saved. And so that is the good news and the grace of our Lord and our Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen? Amen. If we grade or minimize our sin, we've missed the point. If we trust in Jesus, that is the point and the only way we can be saved and sanctified. Okay, Chris, you only got a few minutes left. Uh, chapter 10, verses 19 through 39. Therefore, brothers and sisters, since we have confidence to enter the most holy place by the blood of Jesus, by a new and living way opened for us through the curtain, that is, his body, and since we have a great priest over the house of God, let us draw near to God with a sincere heart and with the full assurance that faith brings, having our hearts sprinkled to cleanse us from a guilty conscience and having our bodies washed with pure water. Let us hold unswervingly to the hope we profess, for he who promised is faithful. And let us consider how we may spur one another on toward love and good deeds, not giving up meeting together as some are in the habit of doing, but encouraging one another, and all the more as you see the day approaching. If we deliberately keep on sinning after we have received the knowledge of the truth, no sacrifice for sins is left, but only a fearful expectation of judgment and of raging fire that will consume the enemies of God. Anyone who rejected the law of Moses died without mercy on the testimony of two or three witnesses. How much more severely do you think someone deserves to be punished who has trampled the Son of God underfoot, who has treated as an unholy thing the blood of the covenant that sanctified them, and who has insulted the Spirit of grace? For we know him who said, It is mine to avenge, I will repay, and again the Lord will judge his people. It is a dreadful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. Remember those earlier days after you had received the light when you endured in a great conflict full of suffering. Sometimes you were publicly exposed to insult and persecution, and at other times you stood side by side with those who were so treated. You suffered along with those in prison and joyfully accepted the confiscation of your property because you knew that you yourselves had better and lasting possessions. So do not throw away your confidence. It will be richly rewarded. You need to persevere so that when you have done the will of God, you will receive what he has promised. For in just a little while, he who is coming will come and will not delay. And, but my righteous one will live by faith, and I take no pleasure in the one who shrinks back. But we do not belong to those who shrink back and are destroyed but to those who have faith and are saved. All right. Um, I, if you didn't spend a lot of time reading this beforehand, I'd encourage you to go back and read this particular section again, because I really think it speaks to a lot of what we've been talking about. So number five, in verses 19 through 22, the author assures us that we can have confidence in approaching God. This would have been mind blowing for the original hearers. Um, if you remember when they came out of Egypt, that God resided on the mountain and said, the mountain is holy. <laughs> no one, not even animals can come up here. Only Moses was allowed to come up there. And, uh, and so 
it, it was a terrifying thing to come toward God. And then while they were in the desert, he helped them construct the tabernacle, which is a moving sanctuary. Um, and then, and he said, that is actually a copy of what's already in heaven. But there was an outer court, then there were several inner courts, and then there was the very innermost. And that's where the Ark of the Covenant resided. And only, I believe it was once a year, on Yom Kippur, where the, the high priest was allowed to go in and offer the sacrifice for sins. But you remember when Christ was on the cross, as he breathed his last, the earth quaked when he said it is finished and the curtain, the veil to the Holy of Holies was torn in two and saying there's no longer a separation. It is God, it is Jesus who has reconciled us back to God. And so that's why he's saying, you don't have to go through anybody else to get to God. You don't have to go through another human being. You don't have to come through me. All you have to do is go through Jesus. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. So I want you to get the imagery of what it would have meant for them, for the, the curtain of the temple to the Holy of Holies to be torn in two it said there's no longer this separation uh, between humanity and, and God. So this would have been just mind-blowing for the original hearers. Uh, I think we talked about it last time. Do you remember what they used to do for the priests who had to go in and offer the sacrifices? Tied a rope around their foot. Why? Because they had one die, and then nobody else was, everybody else was afraid to go in because he offered unholy sacrifices. He didn't do it right. Man, you talk about better read the instructions. You better do know the manual. So they literally tied a rope on their ankles so that if they died for not doing it right, then they could drag them out. So it was a holy, it was a terrifying thing uh, to come into the presence of God. Um, but through the sacrifice of Christ, the curtain, the separation from God has been torn in two. And we now have direct access to God. So you fill in the blank there is direct Number six, in verses 23 to 25, because we have access to God, we should hold unswervingly, even through the threat of persecution. So I reminded you of what they would have been going through at that time. And so he's saying, hold on. Uh, <laughs> the only image I could think of with this is if you're driving down Spring Hill Drive and you're in a lane, stay in that lane. Hold in that lane unswervingly because if you don't, you can get seriously killed, especially if you gravitate toward the other lane with oncoming traffic, all right? So hold unswervingly. He's saying, keep her steady, boys. You know, hold on, keep going, hold on to Christ. Don't let go, don't shrink back, even to the threat of persecution, to our hope in Jesus. No shrinking back to the old system. Spur. Anybody ever been spurred before? Um, you know, we use spurs when we're riding horses because sometimes we need the horse to react a little bit faster than they want to. And so it gets their attention. And so we're, we're called to get each other's attention and to spur one another to good deeds. And continue, as you're filling the blank there, continue, C-O-N-T-I-N-U-E. Continue meeting together for worship, Bible study, fellowship, and mutual encouragement on a regular basis. Uh, I listen to a lot of people who say, we pastors abuse this one. We get it out. We beat people over the head with it. But then they always come back to the, what's the remedy? Uh, going to worship and to Bible study and to fellowship and to prayer. And, to, you know, it's just like they keep coming back to the same conclusion. And, and so, yes, we do use this because it's a direct quote, because the more we're immersed in God, the more godly we're going to be. And as a pastor, I can almost tell you, there's some people who are like burning comets. You know, they come into church, oh, you're the greatest pastor who's ever been. I love your preaching, I love your teaching, I can't wait for the Bible study, blah, blah, blah. 
And then suddenly they're gone. They miss a week, they miss two weeks, they miss two or three weeks. And quite often they'll show back up in my office and say, well, my marriage isn't going well. And it's like, well, I'm not surprised. You get away from God and you get away from his word and you start getting confused about which is the right way to go. What is the right way to think? What is our question of morality? Yeah. But we need to remember that there are two elements of faith. There's our intellectual faith that I acknowledge Christ as Savior of my life. But there's also the volitional part of that where I, he becomes Lord of my life and I'm obedient to him. And the, the signs of my repentance, of my faith, is being obedient to the principles that build my faith. Worship builds my faith. The community of believers builds my faith. They encourage me. They call me to accountability when I'm doing wrong. Mm -hmm. So it's not just, as I listen to you talk this evening about people taking it lightly and flipping, that sounds a lot about intellectual people, but they never come to grips with that lordship in their life. Mm -hmm. And it's both. And it's just not... You know, and sometimes right. we who have been pastors, yeah, if you believe in Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, you'll be saved forever. And we often soft pedal or set aside the count and the cost of discipleship. Do you understand what I'm saying? So I do. <laughs> yeah. And I close with this illustration. If as a person who was in the military, I wasn't in Vietnam, but if there was my best friend, and we were in a foxhole, and he jumped on the hangar nade to save my life, and it blew him to bits. When I got back home, if there's a memorial service, I'm going to be there. Right. You know, and every Sunday, there's a lot of different things. It's training, it's teaching, but it's also a memorial service for the person who died for me in my place. Mm -hmm. You know, and that's... And That's, so it takes yeah. time that we need to remember the seriousness of right. the passion of Christ, the seriousness of, of discipleship. And well, uh, you can't help it. Um, we have family in Tennessee. And when we go visit the family in Tennessee, we come back talking like this, you know, shoot far and all that kind of stuff. You, know, you are who you hang with. And if you hang around Christians who are um, serious and devoted, then you're going to be serious and you're going to be devoted and you're going to keep remembering, oh, I'm not supposed to do this. I am supposed to do that. God is worthy. And that's the number one reason why somebody should be in church is to say, God is worthy. If we come to worship not to get, it's to give something. Uh, but that's the whole idea. And that's why I think I push so hard because I've seen so many people who want Jesus to be Savior, but not Lord. To be Lord, and what does he say? If you want to be my disciples, there's an action step. Lay down your cross, mean, lay down your life, pick up your cross, and follow me. Well, and there, Paul says that in Romans, the end of Romans 5 and 6. He says, now that I've intellectually, I've accepted Jesus Christ as my Savior, what does it mean? That I go on living my old life? Right. He says, forbid, that's not the way you're supposed to do that. You're supposed to be obedient and now walk in a new way of life. Absolutely. All right, we, I know our time is uh, fast approaching <laughs> uh, with my grace. All right, so um, number six. Uh, verse 23 to 25, because we have access to God, we should hold unswervingly, even through the threat of persecution, to our hope in Jesus. No shrinking back to the old system, spur one another to good deeds, and continue meeting together for worship, Bible study, fellowship, and mutual encouragement on a regular basis. And even more, as we see the day approaching. So the day is capitalized there, and that's where the day of Christ, when he you know, comes back, when we all... Uh, all Christian denominations believe in the return of Christ, a physical return of Christ. And, uh, and we don't know when that return is, 
but we do happen to know for sure we're one day closer to it than we were yesterday. So we need to be prepared. Um, there's a sense of urgency. There should be a sense of urgency. And that starts with the you people, U-R-G-E-N-C-Y, to faithful discipleship. We must be ready to meet the king. All kind of parables come to mind about this one. And, you know, the, the you know, so, but if I could do anything is to wake people up and to say, this is serious and we have to be prepared to meet the king. We have to be dressed. We have to be ready. And the way we can do that is by worship and Bible study and fellowship um, and prayer. All right, uh, number seven, in verse 26 through 39, the author implores all Christians to take their faith and their salvation seriously. Cheap grace, which is coined by Dietrich Bonhoeffer, who was killed, who gave up his life at the end of World War II, he was a, a captive, is mindlessly living in accordance to the flesh with a false hope in Christ. For those who treat the suffering of Christ with contempt, there should be no hope of salvation. We all sin, we all make mistakes, but we should continue in our sanctification process through worship, steady prayer, and good deeds. Good works do not earn us salvation, but are evidence. Um, how many times does um, the scripture use the idea of being fruitful and bearing fruit uh, with the vine and the branches? If you don't bear fruit, <laughs> you get cut off, you get lopped off. And so good works are, you know, they're just evidence of our salvation. Costly grace is having a heart broken for what our sin cost Jesus. We talked about that, the betrayal on Monday, Thursday with the passion. Passion means suffering, by the way. Um, and so the suffering of Christ on Good Friday. Number eight, to fully appreciate the original hearers, we must understand many of them have suffered lost family members, jobs, homes, and were under constant threat of persecution and death for their faith in Christ. Our greatest challenge is complacency. C-O-M-P-L-A-C-E-N-C-Y, complacency. For we live in a country free to worship. Worship doesn't cost us much, and therefore many take it for granted. We should be thankful for God's work on our behalf treat it seriously and passionately live for him now and forevermore. Amen. 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 Let's close in prayer. And then as always, I'll be here. If somebody would like to ask questions or make comments uh, after father, we do thank you for this time and Lord, we thank you. And there's just so much richness, in, even within an hour, it's very difficult uh, to cover it all. So I pray for my friends that have come here tonight who set aside their time. They could have been watching TV or news or reading a book or doing any other thing. And they chose to be here. Lord, because they believed in something inside of their heart that says it's more important to be here than to be anywhere else. And so we're grateful for that. But I pray that even as we continue our study and we read from your word, Lord, that we would seek an understanding of what the original hearers must have heard and how shocking and mind-blowing it must have been for them and how easily the threats of persecution against them uh, would make us want to shrink back, to go back to the old system, to go back to the old way, the way that our parents said, our grandparents, our great-grandparents. We are such creatures of habit and how easily we can fall back into what was once a good habit and has become a bad habit. So Lord, we thank you for this teaching. But Lord, I pray that you would just wake us up, that you would set us on fire, that we would not uh, squelch the Holy Spirit, that we would invite the Holy Spirit to search our hearts and minds and, and to, um, to bring to light anything that is impure, that is still in us, whether it's hate or, or thirst or hunger or, or whatever it is, the desire for the world, desire for this life, that we are just any moment just willing to shrink back just to stay out of um, the path, uh, the path of Jesus, the way of suffering. So Lord, I pray that with the author, we would just fix our eyes upon you, 
that we would take seriously um, the work of grace and salvation for us, that your great commitment out of your great for love for us. And then for those of us who have given our lives to you, Lord, I pray that you would help us to let go of our past, that you don't hold it against us anymore, and that we could live this day and forevermore um, loving you and being drawn into your grace. Lord, we thank you in Christ's holy name we pray. Everybody, the Lord said. Amen. All right, God bless you guys. Thanks. And we'll be back here same time next week.